Welcome to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Um, I, every summer, the Ralston Arboretum benefits from uh, four or more summer interns. They're here for three months. It's a time when we um, have quite a bit of staff working in the garden, which is a huge benefit to um, all that happens here at the Arboretum and in the Arboretum's nursery. And um, I have come to really enjoy working with the young adults who are um, our interns. They bring um, not only a lot of useful uh, strong backs, but also a lot of very positive energy. They've given me a lot of faith in the future of um, horticulture. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. My name is Matthew Steele and I'm from Northwest Florida and I'm going to be attending the University of Florida this fall in uh, landscape and greenhouse industry. Um, I'm Danielle. I'm a horticulture science major and I am going to be a senior at NC State. Hi, I'm Morgan. Um, I go to NC State, rising junior. Um, I'm studying horticulture with concentration in landscape design. Hi, I'm Dylan Winstead. I go to NC State and I also am doing horticulture science with a focus in landscape design. And as I said, we have a special guest here in Zoom with us. We have Alicia Thornton, who was our director of development. Alicia, uh, Alicia, I saw you a moment ago. It looks like you have your microphone unmuted and that we can see you as well. Let me see if I can do a spotlight for you. There's Alicia. Hi, Hi Alicia. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. And to the more than 100 people joining us today. So again, I'm Alicia Thornton, Director of Development. I would love to give you all the opportunity to support the internship program. These young people um, are phenomenal. This is a life-changing experience for them. They don't even know what they're getting in store for. It's just week one. Um, all of our volunteers that are joining us today know how um, wonderful it is to get to work with these interns. So uh, we've got a unique opportunity for the next two days. We are using a new platform called Crowdfunding, and I will post a link to it in the chat where we are um, asking supporters like yourself to help us raise $6,000. About $6,000 is uh, what we invest into each person, each intern that we hire each year. Um, so that helps pay their salary and um, provide other opportunities for them. So we've raised um, almost $3,500 and would love to um, bring this home to 6,000 in the next two days. I just did a little math and if everyone on this Zoom, including myself, gave at least $30, we would definitely hit our goal of 6,000. So invite you to um, participate. Also, uh, we're sending out a mailing in the next month month or, or two to our supporters like yourself asking for support of our children's program, our internship program. So be on the outlook for that. Um, and we're always open to feedback here in our fundraising and development department. So I'm going to leave my name and contact information. If any of you have any advice or uh, feedback to provide us, please contact me and we would be um, open to hearing from you and love to work with you. So Again, thanks, Chris, for having me on, and good luck to the interns this summer. It's going to be a wonderful, memorable summer, and clearly we attract talent from all over, not just NC State. So love to see someone from Florida on our team this year. Thank you, Alicia, for joining us. We really appreciate that. For those of you that uh, haven't met Alicia, she's, of course, our Director of Development. And uh, with a very last-minute request, like about a half hour ago, she agreed to join us today. So thank you, Alicia, for doing that. And I'm gonna do a quick spotlight for Doug because we're all here to see Doug talk with us or talk to us about summer bulbs. Doug, it is all yours. Thank you, Chris. And uh, earlier in Chris's introduction, he used a big scary word, geophyte. <laughs> um, we're talking about summer bulbs, but technically, botanically, a lot of them are not true bulbs. Um, but just as we understand that a catfish is not a cat, we understand that when we use the word bulb, we're, we're in a general horticultural sense, um, we are using it for anything that has some sort of underground storage unit. And all of these are herbaceous perennials. Um, and when they die to the ground um, during their dormant season, nothing is left above ground, but the bulb remains, or the, the well, the bulb remains underground. Um, Geophyte is a um, made-up word that's a more 
expansive term uh, than a bulb. Um, but I have problems with the word because geo means earth and phyte means plant. And so any, I, to my mind, any plant that has its roots in the earth is a earth plant. Um, you know, we, there are other plants that are epiphytes, things like orchids and bromeliads that grow up on the branches of trees or lithophytes that grow on uh, stone. But uh, um, anyhow, when I use the bulb today, these uh, very technical botanists in the audiences will just have to cringe, just uh, mute your uh, computer so we don't have to hear the cringing, okay? Um, we are in the warm end of zone 7B here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I think one of the more significant things about our winter is that our cold spells tend to be uh, fairly brief. So we rarely get much frost penetration um, in the ground. Even, you know, 30, 40 years ago when we still had normal zone 7 winters, the ground typically would freeze overnight and thaw out during the day. So, you know, the frost never penetrated even an inch down in the soil. Now, I grew up in zone six, and I know come winter, the ground is as hard as the uh, concrete slab I'm standing on now. And because that frost penetrated deeply in the ground, some of the things that would overwinter here um, would not overwinter in a, in a colder climate. So, um, and I'm saying this because our audience comes from far and wide and not just from the Raleigh area. So um, in a zone six or colder area, and remember the, sh the smaller the number, the colder the winters, um, these things are typically planted in the spring at what, once the weather warms up or grown through the summer and then uh, before the ground freezes, they can be dug and stored over winter or they can be treated as annuals and just let them perish over winter um, um, and replace them the following spring. Um, but in this climate, as I said, most of these things are winter hardy and I, I will try to remember to uh, indicate which things are and are not winter hardy in this area. Um, they, um, are in many different plant families. And, um, you know, not gonna get too technical, but remember that the, it's family genus species, so families are made of many genera. So when I talk about a particular family, um, uh, there's often many genera in that family. The first family I'm going to talk about is the Arum family. It's a huge family. Um, many houseplants like philodendron and spathophyllum are arums. Um, some very important edible plants like taro is in the arum family. But uh, we're focused on um, ornamentals today. And um, most of the, I think all the rest of these plants are ones we grow more for their flowers than the foliage. But in the Aaron family are some that we grow uh, for the opposite reason. We grow them for their showy uh, foliage. I think everybody knows caladiums. These have been in a heated greenhouse. They've been potted for several weeks and they come into growth fairly quickly. Um, caladiums are not winter hardy in this area. Um, this is one that we had in the ground last year and dug before the weather, before uh, uh, freezing weather and have just stored dry. These were in my coworkers, Tim's office all winter. So absolutely no special treatment. They're all just in this mesh bag, nothing added to it. Um, one thing about caladiums, um, if they've been in dry storage for a long time, you can soak them overnight and they will rehydrate and then they will grow more quickly. Caladiums love hot weather. So don't be in a rush to plant them if it's still cool. Um, normally we're a lot warmer than this at this time, but we've ha we're having a week of blackberry winter here where it's in the 40s overnight and only in the 70s during the day. Um, now most people think caladiums need shade. They will tolerate shade. They won't thrive in shade if it's dry. So if you're gonna grow them shade, make sure they have enough moisture because they love moisture. But caladiums will tolerate full sun the commercial growers in Florida have grown probably most of the world's crop of caladiums. 
um, grow them out in fields without a tree in sight. And with enough ir irrigation, they're perfectly happy out in full sun, even the white foliage uh, caladiums. Um, what else was I going to say? I don't remember. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Most very, you can go into a garden center and buy bulbs, um, or you can buy potted plants. Now, more often than not, when a nursery buys bulbs, pots them up, and uh, sell, sells you plants already in foliage, they've been grown in shade. So they will tolerate sun, but the foliage you bring home might burn when you first put it outside. But the new foliage that it puts up because it is developed in the sunshine will be sun, uh, will be fully sun tolerant. Now, closely related and quite similar to the caladiums are elephant ears and elephant ears fall into uh, several different genera, the plural of genus. Um, these are both colocasias. Um, Alocasia is a, a closely related um, genus. And there's also Xanthosoma. And actually some of the really big colocasias are now in a, a new genus. I think it's like Leucocolocasia. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is taro. Um, and if you want one of these beautiful modern um, caladium, uh, elephant ears with colorful stems and leaves, uh, you need to buy one of those. But if all you're looking for are big green foliage, a cheaper way to buy one of these is to go to a grocery store. Now you might not find it in Piggly Wiggly, but if you go to a um, um, international market, especially Asian or Latin American, you can buy taro and uh, planted as an ornamental. Uh, this one came in this adorable little sweater to keep it warm today. <laughs> but, um, and um, the elephant ears, especially the colocasias, generally overwinter here, um, if they're planted in the ground, they wouldn't overwinter in a pot above ground. They can also be dug and just store the, um, the tuber stem, um, just like this one has been in storage probably since it was dug back in the fall. Um, they all will love moisture. Sometimes commercially taro is grown in flooded fields or fields that are periodically flooded, which is one way to control weeds. Um, they, will do, they will do fairly well in shade. Again, like the caladiums provided it's not dry shade. Um, some of the more colorful foliage ones probably are more colorful with more sun. Um, but they're super fun. Pay attention to how big they get. Don't plant the, you know, the giant ones six inches from your sidewalk or you're not going to be going down that sidewalk. Now, an another, um, um, oh, I'm going to set that one aside. Another uh, subtropical to tropical family is the canna family. And it's a case where um, the the family Canaceae get, takes its name from uh, the genus Canna. Um, now growing up in zone six, we planted these every spring and dug them up every winter and stored them dry over winter. Um, but here they're winter hardy, which, you know, when I was new to this area, I thought, oh, this is great. Um, cannas are winter hardy. But the downside of that is in time you have, you know, half an acre of cannas. I'm exaggerating uh, for the first time in my life. Um, but they grow from a rhizome. A rhizome is an underground stem. Um, th these are some that we had to remove from a bed in preparation for uh, this uh, spring's new plantings. Um, both the, well, all three of the plants I've discussed, the um, caladiums, and the elephant ears and the cannas and the ginger lilies that I'm going to get to next are can be bought as actively growing plants in containers or sometimes um, just dormant bulbs or, or rhizomes. Um, and mail order, you know, you can buy them through the mail and mail order is a great way to get a greater variety of things than you might just from your local garden center. But um, if you buy one through the mail, it might look, uh, you know, might just be a rather unpromising, I guess, 
you probably don't want me to cut my uh, microphone cord. And mine arrived looking like this, but don't despair, plant it and it'll soon be in growth. And, and one, one thing I learned, um, you know, just by doing it is, since a rhizome is an underground stem, we all know what happens when you, when you um, cut the tip out of a stem, when you pinch it back, well, then all this um, side buds start to grow. I'm gonna clean this off a little. All right. This is when I should pop the finished cake out of the oven. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Yeah, well, this uh, this is the uh, a ginger lily, a hedicium, and um, it has a rhizome. And again, a rhizome is an underground stem. So, and this is the lead part of the um, stem, you know, which will put up a new growth and then grow on and put up another new growth. But um, if if you divide that into smaller pieces, you know, that might look like your most promising piece, but what I've found is um, this piece will tend to just continue putting up one shoot and one shoot. But when you cut that lead point off, this stem um, has a bunch of buds along the length of the rhizome. And I called it a stem because a rhizome is an underground stem. Then instead of having just that one lead portion, um, it'll put up multiple shoots because all those um, buds that tend to not grow as long as the um, um, lead bud is uh, um, maintaining apical dominance. Chemically, it's preventing those side buds from growing. They sort of don't grow unless they have to. Um, these back pieces of the rhizome will actually uh, produce a lot more stems than that one. So don't despair if you something in the mail comes uh, looking like that. It'll be a lot cleaner than this, but it'll look like that. But the, uh, the uh, cannas and the uh, ginger lilies, here, here you can see a nice big, I just made it, got it dirty, a nice big bud right there on that stem. The little pinky red bump there is an, another bud. But um, the cannas, the cannas and the um, ginger lilies have the same growth habit where uh, the true stem is the underground rhizome and then the, the pseudo stem above ground is just all leaf stalks pressed together and then it becomes a leaf blade, um, you know, further up the stem. And bananas grow the same way. Bananas grow from an underground stem that looks just like this uh, taro. Um, and then the whole stem of a banana is actually, again, just the leaf petioles. It's a bit like a bunch of celery, where the true stem is the knob on the bottom that we tend to discard, and then the rest are just leaf stalks with the actual leaf blade further up. Um, I haven't given names on any of these guys. Um, this yellow striped canna is a Bengal tiger. It's been in the trade under a number of other names like um, Praetoria or Striata or, um, oh, I forget another name. And then this sort of variation on the theme um, is Faison or what was the other name for Faison? Tropicana. Tropicana. Trade name. Yeah. Tro Tropicana is the uh, trademark name for this one. The true cult of our name is Faison with the PH. Um, but uh, cannas also come with green foliage and they have very showy flowers. The small flowered wild types are highly favored by uh, hummingbirds. Um, the uh, larger flowered hybrid ones, um, hummingbirds will sometimes visit, but not to the extent of the smaller flowered species. And a surprising thing to a lot of people is there are actually two species of uh, wild cannas that are native to the Southeast US and the Gulf Coast. Um, but they are, most cannas are winter hardy here in zone 7B because the frost doesn't penetrate far. Um, cannas do, are bothered by a leaf roller 
which isn't a really a, a leaf roller because a true leaf roller takes an open leaf and stitches it shut. But the uh, cantilever, the uh, mom lays her eggs on an unrolled, unopened leaf. And when, when she does, she also stitches itself, stitches the leaf shut with um, silk. And so somebody I worked with uh, years ago called them seal tights, which I think is much more accurate than a leaf roller. And it's a little uh, butterfly relative, a little skipper, several species of skipper that lay their eggs um, on the can of foliage. And then the can of foliage, which when we don't have leaf rollers, you know, can be so beautiful. And if you do flower arrangements, can of foliage is also really good for big, bold flower arrangements because it holds up for weeks. But when, when they're riddled with uh, the feeding of the caterpillars, they're unsightly. The uh, ginger lilies, I've never seen insects eating the leaves. Um, and there aren't very many uh, gingers with um, variegated foliage. This is one that does. Um, it's um, vanilla ice. It has sort of apricot orange flowers in late summer and fall. And the cannas tend to bloom although be in bloom before too long and then bloom up until frost, most of the ginger lilies, the hedicums, don't start until, um, you know, midsummer or later, but then they're real pretty the rest of the summer. And, and many of the ginger lilies are very fragrant. I, I'm not aware of any cannas that are fragrant. Um, and the ginger lilies are close relatives of the culinary ginger and turmeric. Um, they're just in different uh, genera. They're not hedicums. The culinary ginger has the Latin name of zingerber. I'm sure derived from the common name uh, ginger. Um, okay. Well, that sort of takes care of that family. Um, a really big family where many of the members have bulbs is the iris family. And again, remember family, genus, species. In the iris family are, of course, the iris family, of course, takes its name from the genus iris, but there are many and other genera in that family. So, um, you know, real common member of that family is uh, gladiolus. Um, the Latin word gladiolus is the diminutive of gladius, meaning a sword. Uh, but gladiolus is one of those plants that has a common name that nobody knows, which I guess would mean it's not a common name. Um, but uh, because the scientific name gladiolus is referring to a sword, what, a, a common name is sword lilies. But I grew up with gladiolus when I was uh, in single digits. My grandfather gave me gladiolus to grow. He also gave me my own duster so I could dust them with DDTs. So you can blame the loss of some eagle eggs on me. Um, but you know, back then in the, I guess it was the early 60s, insect control was based on prevention, which is an outdated mo mode of in insect control. Now we do integrated pest management where we monitor the pest and only treat um, when necessary. Uh, we don't do any spraying on a preventative basis. And I, when I say we, I mean the general uh, horticultural world and agricultural world. Um, but uh, these are gladiolus bulbs, technically not true bulbs, but corms. If you've grown crocus, you see they are a lot like crocus, which is also the genus crocus is also in the iris family. And one one way one thing that distinguishes a, a corm from a true bulb is a true bulb like a lily bulb or this crinum bulb lives from year to year and gets generally bigger. Um, but corms are replaced every year, um, and this is a another species of gladiolus, which I'll get back to, but this little dried thing on the bottom looking like, you know, sort of like a scab or something is last year's corn. Um, it's all used up now. Um, and this one 
will grow. Well, I'll use the bigger one. This one will grow all summer. This is the, the corn that's going to bloom, you know, produce the foliage and flower. Um, but then by the end of the summer, it's all used up and shriveled up and it's, but there's a new bulb on top of the old one. And again, in zone six and colder, gladiolus generally aren't winter hardy, so they're lifted every uh, fall after frost. Uh, but they're also really easy to store over winter because they just can be stored just as these are uh, um, here today. Um, but in this climate, in Zone 7b, the common gladiolus are, are generally winter hardy. Now, it's a really big genus. There are about 180 species, so many of them don't grow here. Um, the largest number of species are from southern South Africa, where they tend to be winter growing. So they might tolerate freezing temperatures if they were dormant in the winter, but because they try to grow in the winter, they don't survive our winter. But um, these are the a mix of the, where did I put that box? Oh well. Uh, this is just a mix of the common florist type gladiolus, which you know can be used for garden, for a garden display or grown in the vegetable garden and just cut for the house, which I sometimes think is the better use of them. But there are a number of other gladiolus species that can grow. This is a little night scented one. And it used to be in its own genus, Acidanthera, but it's now lumped with the other gladi gladiolus. So um, it's Gladiolus um, morellii, and it's a really good one for us. It's, it's winter hardy and, and you know, just persists in the garden. The flowers are fairly big size. You, you can't get a sense of scale on this, but they're almost as big as the florist Gladiolus. And of course, the florist Gladiolus come in a number of sizes because there are miniature ones and such. Now, a close relative of the gladiolus are the crocosmias. The foliage, all of these have, um, you know, sword-like foliage, a lot like some, most many iris, but, and you can see these bulbs on the crocosmia um, also look a lot like the other bulbs, the uh, gladiolus, and again, like crocus. Um, now, this is a mix of crocosmia. I actually bought these just for the purpose of this presentation today. I don't think I would ever buy crocosmias this way. I'd rather know what I was getting and buy a named variety, you know, like um, Lucifer or um, I'm not remembering other names right now. Buy a named one, um, you know what you're going to get. And I worry with these that aren't identified as to cultivar that you might be getting the weedy wild type, which is one of those plants that looks really well behaved when it's grown in a pot, but you put it in the ground it'll, and it'll try to take over your entire garden. And the moment that it does, it'll never bloom again. So uh, the modern Crocosmia cultivars are well behaved and uh, are, will bloom reliably every, um, every summer. And they're, they're really, they're beautiful. They're like sprays of small gladiolus flowers. Um, um, and coming sort of midsummer when um, you're thankful for anything that looks fresh at that time of the year. So those are the highlights of the iris family. It's a really big family. Um, uh, many of them, not, and not all of them have bulbs like this. Something like a Siberian iris has a fibrous root system and not any underground storage device. Maybe we'll jump to um, everything thus far has been a monocot, a plant with a single seed leaf and parallel venation. Um, but this is the only dicot, a thing with two seed leaves, and this is a dahlia. Dahlias, again, can be bought as container-grown plants or as, uh, you know, dormant tubers in a bag. Or um, if, if you're really into dahlias, you know, look, search for a mail-order source because they'll have hundreds and hundreds of different selections. Um, uh, such a nursery that I've dealt with for quite a few years that um, I really think is a great nursery is Swan Island dahlias. 
they're out in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and when you buy one, you're just gonna get one tuber um, and they will have the name written on it. And I've been really impressed. I'd like to know what product they use to print the name on the label because uh, when I've dug them up in the fall, the, the name is still fully legible after being oh, wow. underground for a whole growing season. Now, underground tuberous roots, you see this is like just a swelling on this root, can be either tuberous roots or tuberous stems. Um, if you think of the difference between a Irish potato, a white potato, or a sweet potato, a white potato, and I know they both come in multiple colors, a white potato has the eyes, those are all buds. It's a stem and stems have buds. But a sweet potato is like this dahlia where it's a tuberous root and not a stem. And there's no buds on this tuber. So if you disconnect it from the stem of the plant, it won't grow. Um, now, this is like the cannas I had earlier. This is a dahlia that we needed to remove from a bed that got replanted. And I could replant this whole thing as is. I could also divide it down into, let's see how far we can go. And this isn't really a propagation class, but you know, if you're growing dahlias and you want to multiply them, division is a good way to go. They can also be rooted from stem cutting and they can be raised from seed, but from seed, they're not going to be true to type. I need my knife. Now, quite a few other herbaceous perennials have tuberous roots. You know, you certainly dug up a daylily and see, see, see that they have some tuberous roots. Um, and even, even something like liriope has some um, tuberous roots or the common house plant, spider plant, chlorophytum has tuberous roots. But those tuberous roots have to be connected to the stem or the crown of the plant um, um, because they don't have any buds on them. But I, I wasn't all that productive. I got that piece. I can't, I don't want to go any further. Well, I'll show you how you can go further if you're super greedy. Um, but you know, these are both good sized divisions. They'll both really make nice plants this summer if, if planted now and uh, kept watered for the first few weeks so they re resettle in. These two pieces didn't end up with the tuber, but they both have some of the uh, underground stem with some roots. So those would make really good cuttings. I probably wouldn't plant these directly in the garden, but I might pot them up and put them in the nursery for a while. But um, in case under anybody out there wondering how you could make two out of that, um, but, well, you get this stuff out of the way. Chris is going to make me buy him a new tablecloth because I'm making such a mess I was already thinking it. that same way, dog. Thinking that same way? <laughs> okay. Um, you can cut one of these stems down because as long as a bit of the stem is still connected to the tubers, tubers underground, I don't, I don't know if this is really worth showing. But you know, as I said, Swan Island dahlias, when you, when you get one, you just get a single tuber. Um, you know, very, oh, I'm not being very successful. I don't think they're gonna give me my surgery license. No, I'm not being successful. Well, we'll do that. There's too much pressure in this job. <laughs> no, I, I completely bet. Botch that up. Well, this piece, the part that these three tubers are connected to is stems, so that'll still make a good one. But uh, that, I, I didn't succeed in showing you how to do that. But, um, you know, if you, again, dahlias generally are winter hardy in, in this area. And again, if you're in zone six and, and colder, you plant them this time of year and dig them up in the fall. They are quite easy to overwinter. Um, they tend to shrivel over winter. So unlike the uh, caladiums and the cannas, if you store them in a little bit of um, 
just barely damp peat, peat moss or something like that, they'll stay in a little bit better condition. Just all these things, if you're storing them over winter, just make sure they're, um, um, they don't freeze. They want to be sort of typical room temperature. This is a different dahlia and the different cultivars will have fairly different um, shapes of tubers underground. This one has short, chunky ones. This has long, uh, slender ones, but the same treatment. So sort of hard pressed to think of it. Many other dicots that have undergrounds. Well, the syningia, which I don't have an example. Uh, another really big family of, of bulbs, and in this case, they are true bulbs. Um, and you know, an, another example of a true bulb are the onions you use in the kitchen um, is the amaryllis family. Now, again, family genus species, the amaryllis family takes its name from the genus amaryllis which is now a much smaller genus because they separated out the things we used to call um, amaryllis into the genus hippiastrum. Hippiastrum sounds like a real scary word, but it's referring to hippo, which is horse, and astrum to star, like in astrology. If you think of the white blaze on the head, forehead of a horse, and you think of the center of a, your typical amaryllis flower, there is a big star in the center of the flower. Um, but I, I was thinking earlier, I don't know if any members of the amaryllis families lack bulbs. Can you think of any, Chris? I can't. I, I can't think of any of them. Yeah. Um, so the amaryllis family also includes the genus um, Narcissus. And well, you know, some of those families have been sliced and diced. So um, I don't know that I'll think of too many others other than a uh, couple that one that I have here. Uh, well, I should talk about this guy, shouldn't I? This is a crinum. This is an itsy bitsy crinum bulb, bulb because the larger growing ones, the bulbs will get as big as a football. And if you have an old clump, like your transplanting grandma's crinums from her home when um, grandma's giving up the old home place, make sure you have some strong back football players to help dig them out because you have to go down a foot or 18 inches to get under the bulbs because uh, you want to make, make sure you don't chop the bulbs in part when you're transplanting them. But this is just a young division. Um, but again, the genus Crinum is quite large and there's many, many man-made hybrids and most of those are reliably winter hardy here. The earliest, um, I'm not seeing any in the bulb border, but elsewhere in the Arboretum, um, many of the earlier blooming ones are in full bloom right now. Uh, uh, Crinum bulba, bulba spermum is in full bloom right now. Um, and I thought maybe a white queen, oh, I see a scape on white queen, but she's not open yet. She's a really gorgeous early blooming crinum. But um, some crinums have a big flush of bloom and then they're done for a year, but m many of them will bloom on and off all summer and some well into fall. So crinums are really worthwhile. Um, they are large growing. Your typical crinum, the span of the foliage is six feet wide um, and they pretty much disappear in the winter, but um, it's really nice to pair crinums with a winter growing bulb like um, the star flower Iphion or grape hyacinths. Um, one will be dormant while the other one is growing, so they're subletting the same space. So if you bemoan the fact that when the crinum is dormant, it leaves a big blank spot in, the spa in your garden, just remember to plant something that's growing actively through the winter months and early spring. Um, and many of the crinums have really wonderful fragrances. If you have a wet garden, there are species of crinums that are very wet tolerant. Um, and a closely related genus in that family are the hymenocallus. Now, hymenocallus means beautiful, a beautiful membrane. Um, the callus part always means beautiful, like in a calla, calla lily. Um, and it, it has. A, it's one of several plants called spider lily, but if you imagine a six petaled flower with a beautiful translucent membrane between each uh, petal, that's where it gets its name, hymenocallus. 
and their foliage is very much like the crinums. Uh, and on some of the more handsome species, the foliage itself is an asset. And it's a big genus, so some are winter hardy here and others are not. But I'm here with a smaller member of the Amaryllis family. This is one of the rain lilies. This is a Habranthus. The bigger and probably better known genus of rain lilies are the Zephyranthes. Our local native Zephyranthes adamasco has already done blooming, but all the rest are um, native to uh, the Southwest US and Mexico and Central America. And they are um, actually South America as well. Um, they are generally summer to fall blooming and they get their name rain lily because they will bloom fitfully um, now and then through their bloom period, but they will bloom really heavily after every rain and actually it doesn't even take moisture, just the air pressure change of, um, you know, a front going through will prompt them to bloom. And so this clump that, you know, one day had no flowers, three, four, five days after rain will be covered with flowers. And they're also um, um, really fun to raise from seed because on most of them, the seed will germinate in about five days. And if you grow them, keep them growing over winter in a heated space, they'll bloom certainly by their second summer. But this is a clump I stole from the garden. And you see that a lot of these rain lilies multiply real freely. You'll also find them for sale in a little plastic bag in a garden center this time of year, and those entirely worthwhile growing. Um, but if, if you want a wide range of really beautiful um, cultivars, go to a mail order nursery. Our local Plant Delights nursery is one of the best sources for rain lilies. And they nowadays they come in, you know, white and pink are sort of standard colors, but many different yellows, orange, and near reds. Um, and uh, you know, if you have a clump that hasn't been divided in a while, uh, you know, they divide very frequently. This will get replanted soon and uh, will quickly reestablish once we water it in and um, will bloom this summer. Uh, let's see. Um, did I run out of things to talk about? No, because we have the whole bulb border. How are we doing for time, Chris? We are doing very good for time, Doug. It is 3.47. So th that means we have about 13 minutes more? About 13 minutes more, which we can do with questions if you'd like. Or uh, or walk around the bulb border. What do you want? We could we could show a little bit of the bulb border. I was really liking what you uh, have behind you earlier when we were setting up. Oh, what did I have? Oh, okay. I always forget what they're called, the little um, things on a stick. Things on a stick. Um, it's, it's a bulb that... Um, Maybe the interns can help me move our... Um, messy workstation out of the way. Who made that mess? Okay. Um, I'm happy to talk about this plant because it's a superb plant that in our experience here gets better every year. There are a lot of bulbs that, um, not a lot of bulbs, but there are some bulbs that either don't do well their, even their first year or might be spectacular their first year and then they dwindle after that or maybe don't even come back the second year. But this is a plant that gets better year after year. And um, it's a Pacific Northwest native. Um, it's Dicolostema. I'm looking for its label so I can wave it in front of the camera and I'm not seeing it just yet. But it's a fall planted bulb, so a little bit outside uh, the, today's topic, but again, thrilled to talk about it. Um, small bulb, about that big. Buy it from any of the bulb vendors, the mail order bulb vendors, like Brent and Becky's bulbs, or Sheepers, or Van Engelen, number of um, good bulb vendors. And plant it in a sunny spot, and it just gets better every year. Is the that more one pink diamond, Doug. Yeah, this is pink diamond. I don't know if you can see the red one over there. That that's sort of the wild wild type, and that's Dicolostema idamei. And um, you know, you're going to have to put up with my telling you the story of the origin of that name. Um, there was this little girl named Ida May 
whose father was in charge of the train station in the Pacific Northwest. And she became aware that some prominent botanists were collecting plants in that area. And she said, come with me, there's this real pretty flower behind the train station. And so they were impressed and they named it for her, which is why it's Dicolistema Ida Mayi, named for Ida May. So these long, scary names aren't, often have interesting stories behind them. Okay. Um, and I see now, um, I had t turned off the eyes on the back of my head and didn't realize there was a amaryllis right here. Um, and I mentioned the scientific name is now Hippiaceum, and you can see, I think, pretty clearly that horse star, the white star in the center of the flower. Pretty little modern hybrid. Um, and I don't know its name, but it's probably on the other side. Uh, this is a really great summer blooming bulb. If we traveled to the far end, we could see some starting to bloom. All this foliage here, it's another dicot. So the poor dahlia that was feeling lonely because it was the only dicot on the table. This is a syningia. If you've grown houseplants, especially if you're, um, you know, been around for a few years, you probably remember the big florist gloxinia that looked a lot like a um, huge African violet. Those are syningias. So this plant is in the African violet family and it's largely a family of tropical plants. And up until maybe 20 years ago, we didn't realize there were any um, um, Sinindia, um, well, any members of the African violet family that were winter hardy. And not all Sinindias are, but um, these are derived from two species, Sinindia. Um, Lordy, what's its name at the end of the, t well, anyhow, Sinindia tubiflora, which has, that's fine. Um, slender stalks of white flower and Lord. I should have t taken two vitamin B12s this morning, but anyhow, they qualify as a bulb in the, in the broad sense of the word bulb. They make this really large tuber underground of no particular shape, but sort of like huge dahlia tubers and they are fully winter hardy. You can see up at the top of the stalk here, flower buds already, they'll be in bloom all summer and very uh, tolerant of sun and uh, drought. Um, I think the amaryllis was baby star. Baby star. I have the advantage of the database records. Yeah. Yeah, the, our database records are really valuable because everything that's in the ground in the arboretum is in our database. It's on a map. Um, I don't have to go out to the garden and look for a label. I can say, well, today I wanted to learn a little bit more of, about an oak in the Arboretum because I was wondering how big it gets. And I knew what bed it was in. And I just put in Quercus in bed L26. And it was Quercus hypoleucoides, which has a silver underside of the leaf, which is what hypoleucoides is referring to. And I now know it can get 65 feet. It's only probably about 15 feet now, now, but now I know it can get 65 feet, which was pertinent to the fact that it got pruned today. And now we know that it's gonna get a lot bigger than it is. And those um, same plant records are also available on our website. If you click on horticulture and then our plants, you can search the records and find out all kinds of details of the plants. So like when I was looking for the uh, amaryllis, I type in Hippiastrum GB for uh, geophyte border and up came all the amaryllis in the bed and I knew which one it was by the flower color and I matched up that way. So no big secrets. Mm. I, I thought it was baby star, but I had to confirm that one. Oh. So use our plant records as well. We freely share our information. So it's all available for you. Thanks for reminding me about that, Doug. Yeah. Um I'm smelling something really bad, and I don't think it's you, Chris. I'll I think you're near me, but I don't yeah, think it's me. Yeah, but I think, I think the dracunculus, I don't know if I'm, I'm probably running over time. There, well, I think we could show that one. Maybe yeah. the interns might need to help me move this table so Alexandra can get a little bit closer yeah. to it, because it is in the far bath. Oh, there, there is one that's open. Um, can I continue blathering, or do no, I, I think, need? I think you can keep on going, Doug. Okay. Um, another member of the Aram family, 
the big family uh, that we met at the beginning of today's program that has um, the caladium and the elephant ears in. But this is, um, this is a European species. It's um, Arum dracunculus. Dracunculus referring to dragon. Um, no, I, well, I might be wrong about that. But, and there's one flower that has already finished blooming and maybe that's the one that's the source of this delightful fragrance. Uh, you know, imagine a fragrance that would attract flies and that's what this smells like. But, um, you know, you think of a peace lily or a calla lily, you have the big modified leaf that's the spathe and then you have the jack in the pulpit in the center was the spadix. Um, and they, these flowers will be open in a, I don't know that this ever set seed so is Tim, no, Tim's not standing by, so don't tell him I'm cutting this flower. Um, but dark, sort of maroon purple, maybe more the color of uh, raw meat or bloody meat that would be more attractive to um, a fly or a beetle. And this was the spadix, which produced the uh, pleasant fragrance. Um, and they really are pollinated by flies. You'll see flies uh, um, flying around. The, uh, oh, it's, it's gotten moldy inside. So if you do tattle on me and tell Tim that I cut this flower, I have a feeling it wasn't going to manage to produce um, um, fruit anyway. You have the um, male flowers on the upper part here and the female flowers down here. If you think of the Italian arum or Jack in the pulpit, they would get quite a bit larger and maybe turn red when they're ripe. Um, now, does it seem strange that flowers are um, pollinated by flies and not butterflies and bees? Well, think about this. Uh, honeybees and other flower visiting flowers were not waiting around for millennia for the flowering plants to evolve. Remember the earlier plants uh, like ferns and conifers didn't have flowers. Um, so the, you know, but there were always flies during that uh, time period. And they were just as annoying back then as they are now. Um, but so, you know, if you smelled like rotting meat or something like that, well, the flies are going to show up because they think it's some rotting meat to lay eggs on. So a lot of flowers uh, smell bad. And if they smell bad, you can sort of guarantee that they're going to be visited by flies rather than, um, um, you know, honeybees or a butterfly. But it's, it grows from, I guess, sort of like a tuber underground, like a Jack in the Pulpit does. Um, it will go dormant fairly soon after the, uh, it do finishes blooming. Um, the leaves are, you know, this is one big leaf. It's sort of horseshoe arrangement of the divisions. And with these attractive white dashes of color on the leaf blade, and it comes up, it comes up while the weather is still really cold. Um, so quite uh, cold tolerant. And th then uh, going dormant in the summer, it's a Mediterranean plant. And so Mediterranean plants often make use of the water that's available in the winter months and then go dormant uh, during the um, summer months. But a really uh, interesting, Again, I'll use bulb in the gen general sense, but a, you know, a geophyte if I'm forced to use that term. We, we looked at dahlias earlier. This is the tree dahlia. Um, it's, you know, it's gonna be twice as tall by the time it blooms in October, November. Because it blooms that late, it often doesn't manage to bloom well, but it's really fun when it does. It doesn't have big flowers, but it has this big branched inflorescence that sort of grows out almost horizontally. And the flowers are pendant. 
So it's well overhead, but you're looking up into the flowers and they look like big purple cosmos flowers. Um, quite a fun thing when it manages to bloom. Native to the Southwest and probably Mexico and such. Well, thank you so much, Doug. It's sure. four o'clock. So how about if we take a few questions? Would that be okay, Doug? That'd be fine. We'll put them on the spot. So if you have a question, please go ahead and ask it out loud. You can unmute yourself, or of course you can um, just go ahead and ask it in the chat and I'll answer it. I believe I've already answered all the questions in the chat. So we should have all those covered. Does anyone have a question for us? When will he shut up? Well, that was the most common question so far. Okay. Well, they're being quiet now, Doug. So it looks like maybe no questions. So thank you so much for a great tour and thank sure. you for joining us interns and introducing sure. yourselves. And thank you so much to Carol and Alexander for uh, helping out with the recording. And it looks like we might have a belated question, Doug. So how about, what's your question? Uh, question, um, you mentioned that you Elephant ears can take occasional flooding and the Hedicium were sort of related and I wondered if they could take periodic flooding. Like, would they be suitable in a rain garden that drains quickly? Um, do I need to repeat the question or? No, everyone heard that okay. one, Doug. Okay, um, well, if I, I must, no, my information was bad if I was indicating that Hedicium is related to uh, elephant ears. Very different family. They're sort of similar in that they're a, a large subtropical to tropical family, um, but they're not related. And the thing about a rain garden, and I think the Arboretum's director put it really uh, correctly, a rain garden tends to be a very dry spot, except for when it's wet. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the plants that go in a rain garden have to be able to tolerate both ex extremes. Um, real dry, dry conditions when it's not raining and then possibly standing water when it is. I wouldn't think Hedicium would be there. It's also, um, you know, don't assume that if a plants are related that they tolerate the same growing conditions. The genus Iris is a really good example. A lot of our Southeast native irises will grow in standing water, but a lot of Middle Eastern iris will die over summer if you drop a single bead of sweat on them over the course of the summer. They have to be bone dry. So, you know, same genus, very, very different growing conditions. So uh, don't make that assumption that a, two related plants tolerate the same growing conditions. And elephant deers can handle standing water. They can sit in it all summer and be quite happy. I did have to uh, mute uh, three different people over here in the participant. There was a little bit of background noise. I didn't want to have that interfering with anyone. If you were one of those people I muted and you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself again. But uh, oh, a little bit blurry. But it looks like that was all of the questions, Doug. Okay. So thank you so much for a great sure. program. I'm glad you could join us and be here with us today. Thank you very much, Doug. And thanks to all the great people that joined us today online. I hope we'll see you again and again and again. All right. What Thank plant you. was Doug just eating? <laughs> An asparagus. Oh, um, okay. we, we grow many different species of asparagus. Most of them are, a lot of them are very beautiful. Um, but this one is also really delicious. I like asparagus. Tim, who doesn't like asparagus, loves to eat this one. Uh, we, we don't tend to eat it when it's at this stage, but when it's tender young shoots. And it's quite a strong vine. Um, what kind is it? Oh, there's probably a label in the front of the bed. Do you see it, Chris? Is... Uh, Micro-raphus. Micro-raphus. Asparagus micro-raphus. Asparagus oh. is a big genus native to Asia, Africa, and Europe, but not North America, even though the um, common one is naturalized in this country. That's cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. What was the name? What was the name of the elephant here? The dark green leaf with the light green thing. The potted one on the desk. Yeah. Um, there's a label in that pot. If it was the potted one that we had on the desk, that's Aloha. Yeah, that sounds right. Aloha. Yeah. Aloha. Well, that's the wrong word right now. Is not Aloha hello, or is it also uh, goodbye? Yeah, okay, I thought Aloha was hello and goodbye. But... Okay. Well, Aloha. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sure.
Thanks everyone, we'll see you again next week.